Welcome to the Michael Artsis Show. I'm Michael Artsis. Thanks so much for joining us. I am so excited today. I mean, I'm, I'm over the moon. This is one of my favorite all-time guests who's going to be joining us in just a minute. I got to tell you how to connect with us first. First of all, we're on every day at 4 p.m. Eastern time. You can check out the Michael Artsis Show. All sorts of great guests in studio and on Skype. And guess what? You can connect with us. You can connect with us by sending us email, connect at beterrific.com. Of course, you can hit us up on Twitter and Instagram at beterrifictv. You can send your photos to our hashtag cube on set and be part of the show. All you have to do is upload them to Instagram, put in the hashtag beterrifictv stage, and your photos will be there. Only inspiring, uplifting photos, please. Have fun with it. Send your gear photos. Send what you're doing with stuff. Having fun, family, whatever it is. Put them up here, and we will have them on air. Don't forget, you can also hit us up in the chat room underneath the video on beterrific.com slash live. Also, we're syndicating all over the place. What's up, Planet 5 Deers? How are you? And by the way, a lot of the friends in Geek Beat are watching right now. How are you guys doing? I know I was talking to Digital Phil all night last night. I know he's watching. Paul Dixon's watching. Love you guys as well. And I uh, hope uh, I got a big surprise for you guys later. But right now, right now, Without further ado, one of my favorite guests all time. This guy is so much fun. He was Hawk on the American Gladiators. Lee Rareman is here, and he's in television shows, commercials, all sorts of stuff. Lee, thanks so much for joining us. Mike, thanks for having me, buddy. I'm, I'm, I'm out here in California being terrific. <laughs> you know, Be Terrific is about you know inspirational uh, stuff. It's about telling great stories, and it's about positive content. And I don't know, honestly, a more positive guy than you. And oh. your story is so inspirational. You started out in business school at UCLA, taking yourself com completely seriously, and then found your way not only into the American Gladiators, but then into acting. But it all started with a joke, right? Well, I, I, I don't, I don't, I've never really taken anything that seriously, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, I was uh, you know I played football at Cornell. Uh, for those of you that are close to you in New York, and I spent a couple a lot of time in the city when I was up in Ithaca. But uh, then I had a had a short stint with the with the Miami Dolphins for about a half a cup of coffee, and then uh, yeah, I went to business school at UCLA. This was early '90s. This was actually pre-internet. I was you know still in fairly good, fairly young and good shape. Unlike both the, actually me now, you you seem to have gotten younger, but. Uh, this, <laughs> <laughs> this was early '90s, and then um, I had a. Uh, I was in business school at, at the Anderson Graduate School of Management. Uh, a classmate of mine had signed me up as a lark uh, on a dare. Uh, we had these fundraisers again pre-internet, you know. And now, now everything's done digitally and via email and or via Skype. And uh, but back then, you know, you actually had to sign up for things with a, with a pencil and a on a, on a pad. And uh, I, the, I, I get a call a week later saying, "Hey, we we, we got your name uh, to try out for the American Gladiators." I said, "You're out of your." bleep in mind and they my my curiosity got the better of me they pestered me a little bit so then my competitive side got got the got the real best of me went out tried out and next thing you know i'm carrying around a big q-tip wearing spandex and getting the snot kicked out of me and that was 20 years ago and i've been in entertainment ever since well you got the snot kicked out of you like one out of every 10 times mostly you were doing the snot kicking, uh, right? yeah we, we we had the we had the good fortune on the show of, of of our roles were kind of being the big the big meatheads uh the heavies and then the, the contestants were always usually a little little lighter and but quicker so some of the events that uh were, were the skill were the skill events and the, and the and demanded some que some speed and agility uh, those guys had a little bit of the of the one up, but yeah, if it was if it came to joust or if it came to to Powerball or, or anything where I could I could hit you, I mean I was you know again I was a football player, so I I I love the contact, um, and you know brown 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 brain matter uh, you know uh, uh, being being uh, being forgiven, I I if I could hit you, I was good at it, but but yeah, it was it was a great experience, you know, I was as we, we were you and I were talking before we went on, um, you know once hawk always hawk and and I. Two thirds of the people in my world still call me Hawk. So there you go. Well, I I love it, and you are Hawk. I mean, you epitomize Hawk to this day in everything you do, and you I mean that's the character you created. Uh, you guys were really like the first reality show because this was a chance for us to see real human beings go against real athletes, and we really got an insight into people's psychology and personality yep. and all this stuff. Um, and so it really kind of, I think this is one of the shows that really spawned this and cops really spawned the whole reality movement. Um, what was the hardest event for you? I, and, and then what was, what was the hardest event? The travel. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, you know, I, it, it, it depends. I mean, 
the the TV it, w- it was a TV show, right? Uh, first and foremost, and so as as an athlete, there was there was a, most of the events were built by TV people. So I, I from a, from a general perspective, none of the events were nearly as hard as you think, uh, and some of the events that seemed easier weren't nearly as easy as you think. They were all about the same, but but a lot of times, you know, there was a the physical challenges were built around you know, running around on carpet that was laid by crew five minutes ago <laughs> or or jumping up and down on, on a pyramid whose pads were, were very loose because it was put together by crew maybe 45 minutes ago. So with with that as kind of a, of a premise, it was just a it was very challenging and taxing on the body just because it was built by TV people. But as far as the events go, I, I got one funny story is when it, when my first season uh, was 1993. Uh, and I was, I think technically it was our fifth season on, on the year. It was really like our third because the first couple were half seasons, but neither here nor there. The, um, I was the rookie. Uh, and so, you know, guys like laser or turbo and some of the senior, the, some of the, the senior guys, you know, I'd come every morning, you'd come in and there'd be a big sh- sheet with events and, and names of, of gladiator characters that were in it. So I remember coming in and, and the one event we always hated was, was the tug of war because they did the, they did the platforms. So we were pulling uphill and the contestant was pulling downhill and it was just a bear. I mean, the physics of it were awful for us. So long story short, I'd come in and, and when I was the rookie every morning, I'd see my name on something. <laughs> and then I'd see laser's name on tug of war on tug of war. His name was all scratched out and in his chicken scratch. I see the name Hawk. <laughs> so I was the young guy. So, you know, before you know it, I'm doing tug of wars all day. Wow. So yeah. And kind of, that, that was the one event that I, that really just kind of just, it was just a bear to do, and I had to do it all the time my first season. Well, and the thing is, no matter how strong you are, pulling uphill to people pulling downhill is is always going to be more taxing and more of a challenge and harder. You know, uh, D- if Paul Dixon is writing in that you were also on International Gladiators. He remembers yep. watching in the U.K., Finland, Russia. Uh, that's pretty cool. I didn't even know that existed. Yeah, you know, we— um Again, and I haven't I haven't really looked at any of the data that goes back that far. But I remember when I was we were, we were doing it. Yeah, we we would do our American Gladiator show, and then we would go over to to England at the National Indoor Arena in Birmingham, and they would do uh, what was called International Gladiators. And if and and I your 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 viewer, I can tell just you know he he knows how big the show was in England, but the British Gladiators was enormous. I mean, it was this was this was like american idol type numbers uh for for the i mean it was by, by far i mean it was like the, the the final episode of of dallas who shot jr i mean the numbers that they pulled were like 60% market share on the british show so um at the time you know we had there was a there was a, a a german show a russian show i believe an australian show and a south african show and then there was two or three others but all all there was about eight teams and eight countries that would go to england after everyone re- finished their respective uh, a domestic series, and we do what's called the International Gladiators, and that was really cool. And what was cool for us was we we were kind of you know we we were the originals, so we'd kind of come in there and you know I, 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 I it was I don't want to say it was kind of like the Pro Bowl for us, but but everybody kind of looked at us as almost like the royalty of the and, and th- that that society in, in England is kind of like built on on respecting royalty and appreciating it. So you know we kind of came over there, and and it was it was like a king's welcome when we go over there, but. Uh, it was. I don't know what the numbers are relative to now, but I was told that at one point the American Gladiator franchise was, or the Gladiator franchise was the most second most watched genre in the history of television behind Baywatch. Wow! And they did. A, I remember we did a promo in like the season seven or something, but they had a picture of me and and Pam Anderson's chest, and it said and it, and a picture of my rear end and Pam Anderson's chest, and it said, you know, this rear end has been watched almost as much as these <laughs> b o o b s so it was really that, that's my claim to fame maybe it's because ice was wearing less clothing than pam pam <laughs> i mean pam had that one piece it, it didn't really help out that's, that spandex did not help a chest i'll tell you that <laughs> male or female well okay uh now uh, if Digital Phil remembers Joust and Gauntlet as great events, um, my favorite is the obstacle course, always. I don't know why. I guess because I think that that's where the underdog could maybe catch up. Plus, it looks like the most fun, and it gives the underdog the most amount of chances to maybe survive. What about for you? What is your favorite event? Uh, with, with the, you're, you're, you're referencing the Eliminator, which was the final obstacle course yes the contestants would go the on we, eliminator we had, a, we had a minimal role in that we would usually jump out from behind and hit him with something or something right. juvenile uh but the um 
The most fun for me, well, two things were the most fun for me, I, and I'll and I'll tell you why for for two very different reasons. I love Powerball. Powerball was, it was just tackling, and again, coming from a, a football background, having done that forever, you know, swinging from the ceiling, all those kinds of things were, they, they were a very f- acquired skill that 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 you know you got better with at time. But right from the beginning, I love Powerball because I could just I could just put my head down, grunt, and stick you, and that was what I loved to do. So that was. That was my favorite at the beginning, all the way to the end. But but what I really uh, enjoyed by the end was was uh, was the rings, uh, which was called the, the game was called Hang Tough. And what if those haven't who haven't seen the show, he would swing uh, across a, a grid, and then the contestant would start on the other end. They would try to get past us to score the points, and we would tackle them midair. And and I you know, I don't want to say I was afraid of heights to start with, but I wasn't I wasn't fond that fond of them. And then also my upper body kind of like hand-eye control in that kind of environment. I just, I'd, I'd never done anything like it before. I mean, I had the strength and I had the grip and I had the kind of the the hand-eye coordination in general. But, you know, my first time up there, I was just like, I just didn't get it. So the first season, I had a, just a really tough time with it. The second season, I, I really worked at it uh, in the off season. We had a little bit of a, of a prep moving into each season. So I had a chance to work on some things. And by the time we got to the international show in like season four, um, I, I was, I had, had developed a, a really good record at it, or it had, 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 had taken what was a terrible record at it the first couple seasons. In the last couple seasons, I, I started to get really good at it, both in, in my comfort level, my one loss record, and just in my presence in the game. So that became one of my favorites just because it was something that I, I, I stunk at, worked at it, made myself get good at it and felt, felt a real sense of accomplishment, uh, having, having kind of pulled it off by the end. I like that story. To me, that was the worst event. And the reason why is because a lot of the events I really looked at and said, maybe I could do this and I could be on the show and maybe I could beat the gladiator here. or I could work to achieve that. And that event never seemed to me like I could ever do it, like I could ever achieve yeah. the ability to be able to beat you guys in that event. And, you know, I never was a fan of the monkey bars on the playground in, 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 in school. And so I, I that and the rings and gymnastics, like the, I could do the rope climb. I could do the, the little uh, horse thing. I could do the pole vault, uh, not the pole vault, the, the pummel horse. And I could do like the jumping off the thing, but I, that anything with the rings just, it's not that they terrified me because yeah. of height. I just didn't have the arm strength to well, do it. Well, it sounds like you had a little bit of gymnastics background, so you were, you know, you're you're ninety percent above of anybody, ninety percent of the way to to being good at it beyond anybody else. I mean, it was for for most of us, even, even us that that had grown up athletes, and you know, I was multi sport athletes growing up, but it was you know, football, basketball, baseball, kind of standard stuff. Um, your feet are on the ground. You're, you're, you're moving around with your feet. Your, your arms are something that you, you do to either tackle someone, shoot a shot, throw a, throw a pitch, catch a ball. You know, nothing like this where everything is, is, at the, is, is anchored uh, through, your, through your five fingers. I mean, that's it. Yeah, that's, right. that's, that's your whole point of, of impact for the, for the act, which was like, you know, it was like going to, going to the moon and trying to walk. I mean, it, to me, it just was not <laughs> – it was so foreign to me. I had no concept on how to pull it off. And then again, my, my, my performance at the beginning showed, but by the end I got good at it. So I really felt like I accomplished something. No, you were, you were phenomenal in the show in general. Um, Ben wants to know what was the, what was the game with the, um, with the Nerf guns, with the oversized Nerf guns? Assault, the assault. Okay. The assault. I remember that. That was the best for us because all we had to do was just sit up there and shoot tennis balls. And if you were, (laughs) if you were real nice, there was, there was a guy, Every day, you, you know, we'd come in and, you know, there's there's a prep for the day and we'd shoot two shows on taping days. There's a guy who was in charge of the canisters that would 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 propel either either our tennis balls at the contestants or whatever they were shooting at us. You know, and if and if you were really nice to them and they knew you were on the schedule for that day to do the assault, you know, their guns would kind of like just and then but then our guns would just come out like a just it, it'd be it'd be it'd be illegal at how fast these things would come out. Uh, so I was really nice to the to the CO2 guy going in in the morning. <laughs> What's funny is we, um, uh, after a couple of, well, after after I was on for a few seasons, we did a children's show called Gladiators 2000. And in, in this, in, in the context of this show, one of the things that, you know, we'd be a coach for these kids. And, you know, there's trivia and fun kid stuff, uh, or fun educational stuff for the kids. But then we'd also, a uh, part of the events, we would actually participate on their behalf. So uh, in the assault, the tables were turned, the kids would be shooting at us. So like I would, I would have a kid up and I'd be up in the perch, uh, and, and I would be coaching a kid who would be shooting the tennis balls. And then, you know, sky or ice or saber or somebody would be down running and we would be shooting at them. And then vice versa, I would be out. And when these kids would shoot at me and I tell you, there's something, there's something about the, 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 the athletic cup 
in a gladiator outfit that is a tennis ball magnet. <laughs> because two out of th- it was like the old Bugs Bunny thing where he's playing golf and he goes and he does that. He, he, he rakes the ball so it goes like this and then it gets into the hole. It's like a tennis ball could have been shot out into the crowd and it would find a way into your into your cod piece in your gladiator outfit. And it was just there's there's a there's a tennis ball magnet in every gladiator's crotch, I think. Yeah, it's. I mean, I think the thing is that also the. I mean, the kids are gonna aim more for that area because they think it's funny, um, as well. But yes, yeah, so it didn't matter. They're gonna. They're gonna. They're gonna aim for. They're gonna aim for the ceiling, and it hit you right in the crotch. <laughs> it's true. It is a magnet. Um. All right. I have two questions for you on gladiators, and then I want to get to the rest of your amazing career and talk about what you do in life. I mean, I know you hang out a lot in Manhattan Beach, and uh, we've gotten a chance to hang out, which is a lot of fun. You're, you're seriously, you're an awesome dude off camera as you are on camera. Um, so, Digital Phil wants to know: uh, Were you ever um, asked to do the reboot with Hulk Hogan, and and were some of the guys, the original guys, asked to do that as well? You know, uh, it, it was a. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And yes. We we had a um, they brought in a few of us. I know I know Dan Clark, who was Nitro. Um, he he was he was involved from the beginning as a, as a consultant and helping some of the guys get ready for some. We were never asked to compete. I mean, obviously, you know, there, that was a whole new breed. I mean, this was in two thousand and eight, the reboot. Uh, and you know, unfortunately, it didn't work. I mean, I I, I have my own uh, my own view on why. Uh, as far as my participation, yes, I was. Um, if it had gone further, um, they had talked to they had talked to me twice. First was prior to the initial launch and and they had talked to me about maybe being the 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 god voice so to speak which was the the, the narrator person that would come in you know do the intros do some of the play by play and then uh, kind of kind of be the, the 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 voice from behind the camera that would talk about the show uh, I, I didn't quite get that but then they had kept me in the loop and they had said look if this goes uh, beyond this first season uh, we we'd love to maybe consider you as the host and they were thinking about um, maybe making a real play-by-play guy. If you recall the show, Hulk Hogan sure. was more of a color commentator with Leila Ali, and they would they would be color commentators, but it was really a post-produced kind of like hosting responsibility. Sure. So it, it really didn't have a play-by-play color commentator feel. They were thinking, if they went to a second season, that they would get into more of a, of a dynamic uh, hosting responsibility with a play-by-play guy and maybe have Hulk do some color commentary for the guys and, and Leila Ali do some, uh, do some uh, color commentating for the women's and then they would have a host, and they talked to me about maybe being up for that role. But it didn't go to a second season, so it didn't quite work out anyway. That's that's a shame. Uh, I would have loved to have seen you on that, and and certainly uh, would have loved to have seen the show really come back and have the success it had in the '90s. And sure, uh, you know, it was just it was such a fun show. It really was. I used to love watching it. Wake up just to watch the show. Uh, I remember. Uh, Nitro and Ice came to uh, my camp to do a personal appearance. Did you guys make decent money on the show? Did you make good money through personal appearances, or was most of it, uh, you know, really just hustling uh, uh, and and getting um, other work? Well, it was it was uh, the, the people don't realize that, and, and you know this because you're in you, you know you're you're on the production side of stuff. You know, we, we productions are very it, it depends. It can be spread out over a long time. What, what you see on television in, a, in in an hour or in a half hour which is, you know, 44 minutes of programming or 22 minutes of programming, you know, how long that was taken to get done is, could be very different. We, we would tape, we would tape, uh, over the summertime, we would tape a, between 20 and 25 shows in about a month. And what, what that would be is we, we would do like 12, 12 to 16 taping days over the course of a month. And we would do two shows on a taping day. So we'd go like four on three off three on four off that kind of thing. And basically shoot how, over about a five week period. How did you guys heal? Um, again, you know, on, if, if it may seem like we were doing a lot, the, the, the toughest part, as I alluded to earlier, was just dealing with TV kind of events that were built on just very unstable surfaces. Sure. And, you know, if you're an athlete, you get into a game and you get excited and you get the blood pumping and then you're in it until the end of it. And then you kind of go home and, and come back a week later. If you're a football player, I, what was tough for me was, you know, you do an event and then on television, it might be three minutes of a commercial break. In in a in the production world, I mean that's an hour and a half for them to tear down the joust and put up the pyramid. Right. So it was constantly, you know, get, getting ramp, amped up for a for a, an event, and then the event's over. Then you got to go, and then you got to rest and maybe sit, and then oh. get amped up again three hours later. I so never up and down was just grueling. Oh, so it, I could. It wasn't so much that there was injuries or, or or that kind of recovery. It was just meant. It was just emotionally getting pumped up for an event six times a day. Right. I, I was going to say I can't imagine that because I I like I know thinking about being an athlete and you're running through that tunnel and you're coming out and you're so pumped up. Yeah. And then you play and then you kind of 
you know, come down and then having to get back up, you know, an hour later. And I know from the TV coming out the tunnel on a, on a, on a taping day, there'd be six events over two shows. So there'd be 12, 12 events basically, uh, or or 12 opportunities for a gladiator. Uh, And then there'd be, you know, six up and down. So it'd be like, it'd be like, you know, coming out for the the opening kickoff six times in a day. It it was rough. Yeah. I've never thought of it actually as a television show. I thought of it as an event. Now I realize it it makes total sense. They're breaking down the set and building up. They couldn't have a room with all those events in one room. It would be enormous. And then then I I, I neglected to to answer your original question. As far as money goes, I mean, (laughs) I wasn't going to let you off the hook. I was going to ask that by the way, I was going to come back to it. Yeah, but uh, uh, we were, you know, we so for the over the we, we were paid a, a show rate. So we, were, you know, we we were in essence paid, you know, for two shows a day over the course of a month. So for that month, there was it was great money. Uh, and then you know, then there was bonuses, and if and there was you know there was uh, you know like loyalty things and and some seniority bumps and things like that. So o- over the course of, of four or five years, uh, you know, but it was good. I, no complaints. Then we get residuals on it and all that kind of thing. Cool. But yeah, but most most of but then that, the good thing is then we did a kid show which had the same kind of. Uh, you know, uh, money stream, and then we did the international show. I got to travel for a month and uh, made some money that way as well. Same same type of thing. If it aired internet, if it aired domestically, we we get the residuals as well on that. So, uh, but yeah, but a lot a lot of a lot of uh, the the upside was was in promotions and appearances, and um, you know we had we had in uh, in, in company promotions where we'd get a little bump to be on you know certain things we, you know for, unfortunately we did not make out on all the cards and the merchandise but that's okay i mean i you know i don't look back on it and oh. and, and, and brood over it uh, right. but but it, you know it led to a lot of other stuff that it's kind of allowed me to have a a nice comfortable career in entertainment ever since you know it and it definitely was uh, a great jumping off point for you especially i love how you had the long hair d pro in the irc chat just put up a uh, picture, the original promotional picture. So if people want to go check that out, and you've got this long golden mane of hair. That no, that may not be me. That might be Thunder. Or, oh, really? I think so. I, I had the, I had just the awful kid and play flat top. Which was did not you really? Oh, I, I gotta find that. Okay, I because I didn't. I thought that when you first did it, maybe you had the long hair, and then you now, and then you no, cropped I, because I, I always that, remembered that, the crop. That's that's. That's Thunder or Malibu. Okay, is. and and uh, were there any romances with the you know ladies and the men? Uh, and and you know, I mean, this was the first time America really saw you know jacked up women in kind of sexy attire. Uh, you know, I mean, we we were out of the road, and uh, you know, we, we, had, we had some fun. We were young. We were we were we were young and in spandex. Uh, you know, we we had some fun. I mean, yeah, no, I, I mean, I, my teammates were great. I, I don't want to I don't want to tell anybody's secrets, but. Uh, but we we had a great cast, great crew, and and it was you know it was, it was as much a lifestyle after a while as it was, uh, uh, it was a team. I mean, yeah. we, you know, we were a team, and we traveled. We did a live show in Orlando where we all got pretty close. I know there was, uh, yeah, there was there was a, a you know a lot of camaraderie and 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 a lot and there, you know at certain points in time people would date internally, and it was never it was never discouraged. And uh, you know, I look very fondly back on all my teammates, and 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 it was great. <laughs> Awesome. It sounds like a lot of fun. I can't even imagine yep. what it was like, and especially like how popular you guys became and going around and doing these personal appearances. I mean, overnight, one day you're on UCLA's campus after playing football at Cornell, and that's got to be some experience. But then you're on UCLA's campus. Your life is moving on. You're not in the NFL. You did, didn't you? Didn't you try out for the Dolphins, or weren't you with the Dolphins on the practice squad, or didn't you? Didn't you play with the Dolphins for a little while? Is that? Yeah, I was in, I was in camp, and you were uh, in camp before I went to business school. Didn't I lasted? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I lasted a. Through uh, through mini camp and then in, in preseason I got cut uh, well, right for the first preseason. Look, it's all for the better. You still have your mind, and then you go to business school, and uh, and and I mean you're totally on a different path. And then here you are, and now you know now you're in movies, you're on television, and you're so great. I love the car shows you're in. Uh, you're in. You, you did the yin yang thing years ago. I love that role for you, where you're coaching people yep. on how to be fit and how to do drills and train. Um, and I love when you do those kinds of shows, but then you're in movies and television and it's so awesome. What is, what do you think is the most fun that you've done or, or other than gladiators for you? Is it acting? Is it hosting? What do you like the best? Uh, I mean, you know, obviously most, I, I like, I like those that pay me the most, which is, always <laughs> cool. but, uh, but it's, I mean, everything's a little bit different. And, and I think that the, 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 the variety that, that each individual thing brings it kind of it, that that makes that is interesting in and of itself. I mean, I just you know I'm on a show called The First Family. I play Secret Service agent Ross Hardis, and we're syndicated. I love uh, this. And we're show. also on BET's sister station, uh, Centric. And our our first season is now syndicated. Check your local listings. It's called The First Family. 
Uh, and that's a that's a multi camera in studio. I play um, I play a Secret Service agent. I'm kind of like a big dumb animal. We have a lot of fun. It's a comedy, multi camera comedy, situation comedy. Uh, and then I, I get to go and 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 host really cool car shows. Sometimes I had a really good run before Speed Channel uh, went away and became Fox Sports One. But I was the the host of uh, of Hot Rod TV for seven seasons. And then I had a really cool run as the host of a Battle of the Supercars for a couple of years, which was great. And that I, was, you I, know, we were out on the road getting to getting to drive and and talk about these some of the coolest supercars on the planet. So you know, you contrast that with what with um, with the show uh, The First Family and the two totally different worlds, production processes, et cetera. And then I just fortunately right before the holidays, I just it, it'll air sometime this year. I just did a, and I'm it's it may be a recurring role. I just did a – there's a new Disney show called KC Undercover, which is a kid's show. And it's Zendaya who did – who was on uh, a kick in it, I believe, was – or no, Shake It Up was was her previous show. Uh, but she, the, it's Disney's big new um, property called KC Undercover where Zendaya plays a spy. Really cool. And I'm I'm uh, one of the – well, I'm not going to – say too much but i'm one of i'm one of the main bad guys at this at this entity that uh is is kind of the dark side in the, in the series so uh you know every every day is different every day is unique uh every day is a challenge but every day is fun you're you're awesome man uh i know that you get to have a lot of fun you get to do all these cool things i'm so jealous of the supercar show i've seen the hot rod show i've seen the supercar show uh, I'm so jealous because you know I love cars, and I'd love it one. I'd I'd love someday. Maybe we can one day host a car show together or do something. Sure. How do you fit in the supercars? Because <laughs> th- I mean they're tight. I know that. And and as a small guy, they're tight. How do you fit in them? Uh, you know, it's it's not. You know, most of these cars. I, I mean, obviously the, the 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 price tags on these would prohibit me even even fantasizing about having one, but, but the, uh, you know, most of them are, are, are not, are not built for like a daily driver. So it's right. a, you know, it's, it's a different, it's, it's a different mindset when you got, you know, a coat and tie and you're at six in the morning, you got a cup of coffee in your hand, you're getting in a car to go to work. You know, you want comfort, you want the heat to come right on. You want to be able to just kind of slip in, slip out. Uh, whereas these supercars, you know, when, when you're, when you're, and if anyone has not seen the show, we would take supercars. Paul Tracy and Tanner Faust were two professional drivers. I was kind of like the, I was the host, but I was more like the cat herder. Wait, you know, let, let me stuff. let me give people a little. Uh, Paul Tracy's a, a NASCAR guy, but Tanner Faust, we know Tanner well. We've done a lot with him in the past. Tanner yeah. is a great guy. He is not only the drift king of the world. He's like the best drifting driver in the world. Rally guy. He is a rally racing guy. We've done a lot of rally racing coverage with him, and he's just about the only guy who can co- really compete with uh, Travis Pastrana in yep. the rally circuit. Tanner's and great. And Tanner Paul, is great. Yep. And, and Paul, Paul comes from the open wheel side, the IndyCar. So, yeah. uh, you know, you had two different disciplines. Obviously, Tanner is the is the rally and the drifter guy. Then you had Paul, who is the, you know, open wheel, go 200 miles an hour guy. Two very different disciplines. And they, you know, we would we would match up cars and then we'd put them in, in, in the different cars. And I would kind of be the, 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 the referee to keep them from killing each other. All in fun. They, they were, yeah. they were, we were all great buddies. But, I mean, I've yeah. seen you I've seen you break the back wheels loose and do all sorts of stuff on, on that show and then the Hot Rod show. Yeah. Um, is I mean, is that something you always did? I mean, I'm a car guy. I could break the, the wheels loose on a, on a powerful car. Did they have to teach you to, how to do that? No, I mean... You know, <laughs> You're like, I, no, I just stop on the gas pedal. It's a 1,000 horsepower. That's all. Well, they, you know, I mean, series. I would get to drive a little bit, but but it the it was all about P- uh, Paul and, and Tanner driving yeah. the cars and and, the, and putting them through the paces. I would get to drive a little bit, and we'd have segments where I would drive them as well, and you know, bumpers, ins and outs, and talking about the cars. But when really kind of putting the pedal to the metal is where where Paul and Tanner kind of did their thing. So that was that was their expertise. I was just there to at, at that point when they were in there and and the and the pedal was down, the, the accelerator was down. I would, I was just trying to stay out of the well, literally try not to get hit, but. <laughs> Uh, you know, we were out, we were out on, on, on airplane runways and things just doing some crazy stuff. I mean, so cool. Tanner Tanner and this guy Ken Block can control a car like nobody I've ever seen. Ha- They're like maestros. Yeah. I, I mean, were you ever scared with Tanner or were you ever – and I imagine every time you're like blown away that he turns the car around on a dime. You know, Tanner Tanner is su- – he's, he's such a, a, a tactician and he's – you know, if, for those who don't know anything about him, I mean, you know, Tanner's an unbelievably bright, educated guy. He's got a – uh, he's got a, I think his degree is in genetics. I mean, he's got a bio, F, biogenetic degree from from Colorado. Really smart cat. So he he takes a very kind of like statist- statistical, mathematical, physics 
view of 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 the crap. So I was never scared around Tanner. Paul's a bull in a china shop. <laughs> Paul, Paul Tracy is he's, he, he comes from he comes from the I don't know where I mean he's from Canada. I don't know where in Canada, but he's just he's just a kid who grew up just driving fast before he was smart enough to realize he shouldn't go that fast. And he is just a salt of the earth. Go f yourself. I'm going to drive this car faster than yours. And he's he, he's 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 very uh, efficient at what he does. But man, he pushes he pushes the limits, and you know, whole different craft in his head. I mean, he yeah. you know these guys go. It's open wheel, so you know they're right. they're going you know two hundred miles an hour all the time. Tanner and in, in his in his craft, it, it's much more of a finesse, control the the the, the arcs and, and and know where the where where the where the where the points of inflection are on on turns and things. With with Paul, it's a whole different game. It's go fast and and, and go just get in front of the other guy. Absolutely, and, uh, no, no, no. It's much different. Uh, Scars Scarborough, Ontario, Canada. By the way, is Paul Tracy, and he's done. Geez, just about every single series in not only NASCAR and open wheel, but, yeah, I mean, he did uh, go-karts for a long time. Then he went into the truck series. Then, I mean, the Grand Am Rolex series. I mean, anything that is track-driven, he has done except for drifting. He's not done yeah. the trick kind of things. That's well, what Tanner for those that the, are, the rally, which those is that are, that are big, uh, that are big indie fans, you know, yeah. he, he, he won the indie fight. He, he was part of that 2003 controversial finish where he had won it and there was a, the, it, there was there was a, a, a discrepancy, and they put they they took it away from him, put him back to third. Said he fouled and all that kind of stuff. That was a, you know, Paul Paul's participation in in in, in the open wheel uh, racing world is 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 famous and infamous. Great guy, great driver, very successful. Um, but you know, when you're at it that long, you know, you, he 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 had the well. That that was one one example. Uh, but he he's the driver who historically has gone into the other guy's pits and started fights. <laughs> Like he cut off, so. <laughs> He's trying to have a hockey game at a, at exactly. a, at a race. Exactly. Uh, I love that intensity and passion. Uh, you guys must have had a lot of fun on set and, and nice. offset afterwards. Do you have a favorite car? I, I always ask you this. The last time I talked to you about this, you said, you know what? I'm just, I, like you said, I like getting up in the morning, getting into a nice car that's a little luxurious, that starts, that has heat, heated steering wheel, heated seats, whatever I need, but nothing crazy. Yeah, uh, you know, in, in that in that series, I, I I had the privilege of driving the uh, the Continental Super Sports, and yes, it's Super Sports with an S. I have no idea why, but it's the uh, the, the Continental. Uh, it's 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 a Bentley. It's yep. a Bentley Continental Super Sports, and it's uh, ten cylinders, about six thousand pounds, and it just it, if you're a car guy, it just makes you horny. I mean, it's just <laughs> great. I, I mean, it, it's big. It's you know, it's some of the some of the finesse things we they tried to do. It it it, it doesn't it doesn't doesn't compete against some of the other right with the torque and no, things. It's so heavy, but just like almost a thousand horsepower, and it's just like if you're a dude who likes cars, it's like yeah. And it's a good balance between beauty and luxury and right. also sports car. It's Yes, it's not going to be as nimble as, you know, a uh, GT3 Porsche or something, but it... Right. it or it, some of the new Lexus models or something like that, right. that you know, no, no way. But, it, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, and I'm not a Bentley guy. I'm, I'm, you know, <laughs> Bentley's always seemed like your great-grandfather's something out of a 40s <laughs> not, movie. Not this one, though. Oh, this no. This one's a this one's a sports yeah. car that's just too big for its own good. There's nothing that puts a bigger smile on my face than just driving fast and having fun in a car. I got a chance to drive a uh, 911 uh, C4S last night with a big well towel. Uh, oh, wow. I was supposed to take it out for like a half an hour. An hour and a half later, uh, I'm like, yeah. Um, oh, sorry, there was traffic. I sat in traffic for like an hour. Sorry about that. So <laughs> that was a lot of fun, and I always yeah. love cars. What do you do for fun uh, to relax? I know you spend a lot of time working out. You spend a lot of time riding your bike and, and then hanging out on the beach and stuff. And uh, it, it's it's you know it's fun. It's a it's a blast to hang out with you. What do you do for fun <laughs> though? Uh, you know, I just uh, you know, I live in Manhattan Beach. I'm, I'm a South Bay guy. Well, I'm a, I'm a in Southern California. There's Manhattan Beach and Hermosa Beach, and it's referred to as the South Bay. Uh, and I just you know, I, I live I live a, a steps from the beach and love it down here. And uh, you know, in, in my in my daily life, it's the, the comings and goings are pretty hectic, and people and and studios and in and out a lot of time in the car. So uh, you know, my my social fabric is built around just beachy things and bike riding and, and just chilling and hanging out and just in, just enjoying beautiful days in Manhattan Beach. I've got a friend, Handsome Jarrett. You guys would hit it off. You'd have a good time going out. Obviously, you and I, we had a great time hanging out. I, we got to do it again. But you guys are, you have the same build, the same confidence, the same attitude, and the women love you both. I mean, uh -huh. 
I mean, it literally, everybody knows the, the epic stories of, of, of my friend Handsome Jared. Uh, unbelievable. I'll tell you real quick, we were at the Super Bowl a couple years ago with all these guys wearing their Super Bowl rings at dinner, and uh, the waitress walks up to Handsome Jared at the end of the meal and hands him a novel asking him for a date, um, saying he's the most handsome guy she's ever seen. The, the athletes were like, don't ever bring him around again. Um, well, do don't you- bring him around me either. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you guys would do very well together. Do you get hit on on every set by every woman? Like, I know you were in the commercial with Carmen Electra years ago where you were security for her at the Super Bowl commercial. Do you get hit on by, I know on the street you get hit on by all these women, but do you get hit on by on, on sets and stuff? Do the actresses hit uh, on you? Because that must be a lot I, of fun. You know, no, look, I, I appreciate the compliment. I'm, I'm very, thank you very much. But, I mean, you know, but... Honestly, back back when I was doing the Gladiator thing from, you know, the mid-90s, I mean, that was a pretty crazy time uh, as far as, you know, running around the country and the, and the, and the and actually the, the, the planet with, with being a, a single guy doing Gladiator stuff was pretty nuts. But, you know, the, the last decade, I mean, I, I live with a, a, a beautiful young lady. She's my girlfriend, and uh, we're, we're pretty serious. And Wow, it has been a long time since we've hung out. <laughs> well, see, listen, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm knocking, on, I'm knocking on fifty, man. So, no, you're so, not. You know, Are you really? Yeah. I'm so. First of all, I'm so happy for you. You look great. And second of all, I'm happy that you found somebody that's special, and and that's great. I, you know, because we were talking off air before before we started about how you know we haven't seen each other in so long, and it's a shame. And it's amazing. That's terrific, man. Thank, thank you for sharing that. But that congratulations. That's great. Oh, right, any any time, bro. That's awesome. Um, Jenny writes in the chat room that there was a Finnish Gladiators. Did you ever go to Finland? Never went to Finland. Okay. Uh, the the Finnish the, the 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 Finland team came to the international show. Uh, okay, and, and this would would have been nineteen ninety four and nine summer of ninety four and summer of ninety five. And then I think it aired like over the course of the following year into the next year. Uh, so so yet I competed against them, but all of our international stuff was done uh, in Birmingham, England. So did not go to Finland, but competed against them in the international show in England. Awesome. Very, very cool stuff. Uh, Lee, I could talk to you forever. We got to have you on again soon. Uh, Anytime, brother. We got to promote everything you're doing because everybody's got to be watching. It's all so much fun. Before I let you go real quick, what do you do to work out and what tips do you have for people? Because I think this is really important now. Uh, you know, and I think that what's great is tech is really pushing this now sure. with the fitness bracelets, uh, the activity bracelets. I've got the uh, Jawbone Up 24 I've been rocking, and it okay, really does great. help to motivate you um, a you know, little bit. And, and as I've gotten older, I mean, my, my, my philosophies haven't changed. Obviously, my, my tactics have a little bit just because, you, you know, you can't a 40 year old body can't do it. A 20 year old body can, but my, my recommendation to people is just, you know, set, set, set realistic expectations and stick with it. If, if it's pick your, pick your passion, whatever you like doing, uh, do it, set expectations that you're, you know, you're not going to look like, I, I'm not going to look like an American gladiator tomorrow anymore. I mean, I'm almost 50. So don't, don't think that you're going to in six, in six days or six weeks going to, you know, be a fitness model. Just, just set a, set a goal of losing 10 pounds and then set another one after you get there and then pick pick something you like doing and just and stay consistent with it. My, the, the downside to what people do is they they jump into something, they go crazy with it, and then they burn out too fast. So proper expectations and pick something you like to do and then stick with it. I love it. Um, and you ride your bike a lot. You you eat right. I know that. Um, what do you do other than that? Do you you lift weights? Drink beer. Drink a lot of beer. <laughs> so what do you no, do to I, balance I, I, that? I, You've got to do something. Uh, no, I do. I like I do a, a daily walk on the beach, as I mentioned to you earlier. I I, I do that in the mornings, uh, or or you know, sometime at lunch if I have something going on in the morning, and then uh, late in the day I'll go to the gym about, about five days a week, but for but just for a quick hour. Do a, and I do a little cardio on the on the treadmill up here. Like I, every once in a while I'll, I'll get cocky and try to run again, but I'm just I'm still too heavy. And fortunately, my my from the weight from the waist down everything works fine. Uh, but so my knees are fine, but, but, you know, if I try to run, I just get too sore too quick. So, uh, I just, you know, just, I just pick my cardio more of a slow burn than when I was younger. Uh, but yeah, just treadmill uphill at the gym and then I walk on the beach and then in between I, I do the, so, some good, some good cardio infused, uh, weight training, uh, when I go to the gym. So, you know, pretty standard stuff. Very awesome. Um, I love it. It's, it's, uh, I think that's a good, a good routine. Um, and I know you ride your bike a lot on the beach. Yep. Uh, that's super cool. But that's casual. I, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not, 
I'm not one of these. I mean, if, if anybody's ever ridden a bike on the out here, we call it the Strand, but it's, yeah. it's a the boardwalk in Manhattan Beach, into Hermosa. You know, if, if you if you try to if you try to pawn that off as exercise, you're crazy. You're, no, you're but going it is about two it, miles an hour down a flat surface. It's keeping you active. It is yeah, some sure. sort of fitness. It's better yeah. than you know sitting in, in a golf cart or something or using a Segway. Sure. And um, look, I mean, if you, you do it a lot, it's a good mode of transportation. Yeah, but you do it a sure. lot, so it, it winds up being a little bit of a workout. Yeah, you bit. know, it's not strenuous. You're not running. You're not racing a bike or training for a, a no, bike. But, but I still. But I st- even if I've done my walk in the morning and then I still got to go to the gym later. So if I do a bike ride, it's just a little bonus in between. Nice, very nice. All right, everybody can find you at Lee Rareman on Twitter. You can also go to LeeRareman.com. Don't forget about the First Family. It is an amazing series, um, and we got to have you on regularly to promote everything you're doing. But just to check in also and 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 find out all sorts of great stuff. You're. Awesome. I'm glad that you came on. Thanks so much for doing it. Uh, brother, thanks for having me. And, l- and listen, if, if you're out here this way on a personal note, you know, let, let's get together again. And if you want to do a remote thing, maybe we'll do something from the beach out here and uh, and just, just tie it in via Skype or something. Oh, absolutely. We're definitely going to make both of those things happen. I will right. be out there, so we'll make that happen. And when you're in this area, I mean, get, would you get on a CSI so you can shoot something in New York? Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, when you're out in this area, um, you know, obviously we want to have you in studio, but you you got to be my guest as well. When, uh, Buddy, I'll, when I'll let you know if, if I'm ever that way, you got it. I know, I know you don't like the cold weather, so in, make it in the summer. And hey, uh, I, went to, I went to Cornell. I went, I went to school in Ithaca, so I, I, I got enough of it over, over the course. Right, of that's it. it. It's over. You don't need it anymore. No more. <laughs> you're the best, Lee. Thank you so much. You got it, Mike. That's Lee Rareman, everybody. Hawk from the American Gladiators. Uh, lovely, special treat. What a great guy. It, just a lot of fun, good advice. And we what an inspirational story because the reality is here's a guy who was, you know, uh, on track to be a professional football player. That didn't work out. Then he decides business school is for him and then becomes an American gladiator. Could have ended there, but it doesn't end there for Lee. He continues to go into uh, the American gladiators and acting and have just a wonderful career. I'm glad that uh, you guys got to enjoy that and uh, are watching it uh, all over and chatting in the chat room and, of course, in Geek Beat. I love uh, the whole Geek Beat family and the Planet Five Deers. We're going to come back and do a whole lot more. we got to take a break, but I've got this for Digital Phil real quick. We were chatting about this last night. I don't know if Pete can get this. He might have to pull this shot out on the center camera real quick, but I have got a pair of sneakers here that I... I love, and I've got to show off. Here we go. You know what these are? I'm rocking these. We're going to get a shot of these later at, after the commercial that's better. And these are the Nike Air Flights from 1989. These are almost the exact colors I had them in 1989. Uh, they were white. These are a silver uh, reflective material, so they're not leather. We didn't have to kill a cow. Uh, my wife is... Uh, you know, very, very much for animal preservation. So I figured why not make her happy and go with these. They're Nike ID, and I'm so excited to have them. We'll show you them in all their glory when we come back. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back right after this. I'm Michael Artsis. This is the Michael Artsis Show. Thanks so much for watching. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the Michael Artsis Show. I'm Michael Artsis. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Lee Rareman, what a great guest. Hawk from the American Gladiators. We're going to definitely get him back on in the future. We'll do a remote from the beach at some point. We'll do all sorts of fun stuff with him. Uh, we'll keep up with his career as it evolves and continues to evolve. Just a great story. Really positive guy and a lot of fun to be around and hang out with, too. So we'll try and capture that some of that on camera as well for you. Of course, this is the daily live show for Be Terrific. We're live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern time, so check us out. You can connect with us, connect at BeTerrific.com. Hit us up on Twitter and Instagram, at BeTerrificTV. Don't forget about uh, the fact that you can also send pictures to the hashtag cube on set. Um, that is, take your photos, upload them to Instagram, Add the hashtag be terrific TV stage. And then, of course, you can chat with us under the video player uh, as we're doing the live show on be terrific.com slash live. Thank you guys so much for watching. Um, I wanted to share these Nike flights with you. I told you uh, before we went to break. So Pete's going to pull these up. And uh, this is how they look with like, I don't know, almost a suit. Uh, my mother always told me I couldn't wear sneakers my whole life. And I'm kind of starting to get into it and try to make it happen, especially because I got a bad hip. Uh, the New Balance seemed to work, uh, and the ASIC Keanu 21s seemed to work the best for my hip. 
These are more fashionable, less functional, but I love them. I had these in 1989, almost the same colors. They were white leather. These are silver uh, reflective material. And uh, then the rest of the color scheme is the same. I did them custom on Nike ID. What do you guys think? I love them. I think they're cool. And now that I see them on camera, I think they're even cooler. What do you think, Pete? I, I wonder what Pete thinks. Um, they're a little reflective on camera from the lights. No, they look, they're great. They're, they're all the old uh, Nikes uh, classics, man. Yeah, uh, and, and Ben said he, he loves his old Jordans. I think the original Jordans are my favorite. I had the fives and the fours and the sixes. And I think that the fives, fours, and sixes um, were probably the ugliest ones. I think the, uh, the fives were probably the best of the ugly ones that I had. Um, and I really do like the old school, original, the Jordan 1s, especially in the original colors, which are hard to find at this point. I also like them with that original logo with the basketball with the wings and the Air Jordan written above the basketball. And now it's hard to find a pair like that that just has that logo because now they a lot of times put the Jordan logo on the front and on the heel of that shoe. Um, but to get it in its original colors is pretty rare, and I don't know if you know this, but he was fined every night by the NBA for wearing those when they came out because they did not comply with the code of conduct policy at the time and the, and the code of uniform policy, and Nike paid that fine every night. What a smart marketing move and a great move from Nike to do that, to step up and do that, and they really were the first you know, big-time, huge athlete shoe. I like the new Jordans, by the way. They look super cool. I tried on the Kobe's recently they're super expensive very comfortable but they're way too expensive 245 for a sneaker they're nuts especially the kobe's with kobe nines with the air knit thing unbelievable and they're low tops which is cool um i'm kind of getting back into sneakers again i love it i i saw in vegas the david robinsons you remember those pete they were the nike pump the admirals i wanted those so badly and i almost plunked down for them in vegas but they are so big and clunky and ridiculous and we didn't have time to do it also what about uh, my other favorites that I've never w gotten? I bought and returned them once, but I wanted them so badly. It was the Nike Air Revolutions, which were the first Nike Air with the air bubble. Pete. I never got into the, the, the Admirals. Never? No. I like oh, the I Ewings, the Jordans. I got the, the Webbers were uh, one of my favorites. Um, what else? The Hardaways, the Penny Hardaways. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, there were a lot of cool shoes in the, in the 90s and 80s. I, I mean, I, I just saw when I went to get these at the Nike store uh, before they closed the ID lab, you could go in there and do it. They had the Agassiz. Um, that was amazing. They had some really good throwbacks, the original Agassiz. The uh, pumps. What about the pumps? Well, the pumps were the Robinsons. They were the Admirals. That's why I love were those sneakers. Yes, that's why I want those so badly. And then they had the huge air bubble. The first time they had a huge air bubble with the bottom exposed, it was unbelievable. Uh, those were the coolest sneakers, I think, ever when, it, when they came Maxes. out. The Air Maxes. The Air Max 95 is a great shoe. I, Clinton Portis had like 50 pairs of those when I was in his closet. He was showing me a sneaker collection. He had Croc versions of them. He had Crocs. Croc skin on them. Uh, there, I mean, all sorts of different color combinations. The athletes have the most ridiculous. It's unbelievable. You can't even. They, Nike like totally sends them special stuff. It's it's completely different. What about the Reebok pumps though? Those were huge when they came out. I had those. I had the. I think I had the Michael Chang's and uh, no, that's what with I the was tennis talking ball. About. The Reebok pumps. The Reebok pumps. Yeah. And then I had the one with the basketball in the front. I don't know. And then I had the Insta pump with that little CO2 cartridge. So cool. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, that was. Uh, you had those? You those had the pumps? I had the pumps, yeah. Yeah, those were cool. What I about think I had the, the, the tennis ones because they were cheaper. Uh, were they cheaper? Yeah, they, they, they were definitely cheaper. The, the basketball ones was almost 200, I think, like 180. No, they weren't. And yeah, they were 180, I think. You're yeah, right. Back yeah. then, so that back was crazy day, money. That was ridiculous. The Admirals are 200 and now. I wanted them. And I think the tennis ones were maybe like 120, so uh, yeah. I went with those instead. In 120, you got ripped off. They were like 110 back then. I keep Pete in the dark, by the way. I, I told him, no more light on you. We don't want people to see you. No, I'm kidding. I, why are this, isn't there no light on you today? I'm not on camera. You. Are, what are you doing right now? Where? What are you yeah, now? Well, just a little bit, but in <laughs> general, I'm not on camera. You, you look literally like you're breaking into the studio with the hat on I and gotta everything. I got to see the, the buttons. It's easier in the dark. 
<laughs> I, I, the uh, digital Phil likes the Reebok pumps. I, uh, I I didn't like the Reebok sneakers as much as Nikes. I didn't feel they were as comfortable. But I will tell you that I love those pumps, and I I remember uh, wearing those pumps out, and then especially the Insta Pump, and carrying the little Insta Pump thing in my bag, and then uh, my friends would take like the 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 little basketball off the pump and you'd see that little black thing, the little black bladder. Uh, the pumps were awesome. I, I really don't know why Nike never stuck with the pumps. The Admirals, I think, were their only version of the pumps, but they're super cool. And uh, of course, you got to love the Air Mags. There are so many amazing sneakers. And when you go to Nike and do this stuff, you get so into it and you see that there are so many. But the, the Jordans for the Jordans, it's definitely Jordan 1s that are the best. And y there are so many special editions now, even of the Jordan 1s. It's, it's super cool. I love getting into sneakers and stuff. It's, it's really awesome, Pete. Uh, Jordan 11s were my favorite. Yeah, you like the Jordan 11s. Were those the Space Jam ones, or were those yeah. the n those were the Space Jam yeah, ones? Yeah, Space Jams. I I like uh, the 11s were alright. How, how about the ones that had like the uh, the the big straps around them that were like the sevens or eights, something like that. Uh, those were crazy shoes. I don't know. Uh, I think that uh, Jordan definitely had some interesting shoes. Basketball shoes are, are super cool. By the way, Pete, I don't know if you know this, but uh, uh, football gate or uh, inflate a gate or deflate a gate has gone a little bit further, yeah, apparently. They, and I, they found like, what, 11 out of 12 balls being uh, deflated? I want to point out a couple things. You remember the other day I talked about this and I said this is common practice in the NFL that p uh, teams screw with balls. I said, number one, it's, it's, it's common practice. And if the NFL wants to eliminate this, they should provide the balls and if they feel that the team should pay for them then they should just charge the teams number one number two the referees have a huge responsibility here and I want to hear about that because the referees have are supposed to inspect the balls and clearly didn't unless in cold weather by the way and and in very hot weather pressures change I don't know if you know that I know that from tire pressures but two pounds of pressure they're saying per ball was missing on a ball that's 13 pounds of pressure inflated so you're talking two pounds is probably very noticeable it's very squishy i would think you'd notice it immediately and it would be very very hard to throw a deflated ball in any weather or partially deflated like that um but i gotta tell you uh, brad johnson came out today and admitted that in super in the super bowl in 2003 against the uh raiders he paid somebody off to scuff the balls because they're so slick right the, the balls are so slick they're like wax the brand new balls so he paid somebody to scuff them up which uh, uh john gruden who was the coach of the bucks and had just left the oakland raiders at the time uh to be the coach of the bucks uh basically said that he was aware of this he didn't say if he knew if he paid him off or anything or if it happened before or after. But, I mean, this is common practice in the NFL. I'm not saying it's not cheating. I'm not saying it should, shouldn't be stopped. I'm saying we should all know it is common practice for teams to fool with the balls. And, look, I'm sure that the NFL did this because when the NFL started, they couldn't afford to pay for the balls as a league, and so they had the teams pay for them. But it's time to move on, even if you want them to still pay for them. Pay for the balls. Just have the league provide them. Why are we talking about if – if the balls have been doctored. It's ridiculous. If you really want to stop something, and this is the problem I have with the NFL, that they keep saying that, oh, you know, whatever, and they, if the NFL wants to stop stuff, they can put a stop to it. It's very simple. Doctoring the ball can be put, a, they can put a stop to it. Why are we discussing this a week and a half before the Super Bowl? It's absolutely absurd. So I want to bring to light the fact that I, I said that, uh, it was, uh, you, you know, that this is common practice, and I want to bring to light that uh, Brad Johnson said that, uh, what he said. And, yes, it is still cheating. I don't think it's the biggest deal in the world, and I really still think it affected both teams because while each team provides balls, the visiting team provides a backup set of balls. So, realistically, the home team and the visiting team should be using the same balls unless they need to go to the backup balls. And the one thing about that is that, you know, th throwing with deflate of balls is harder, I think, even in, in, in rainy, cold weather. But I will say that the only edge the Patriots would have there is knowing the balls were deflated, at least until the, the uh, Colts got their hands on it, um, because then you'd obviously know with two pounds of pressure missing from a 13-pound ball. But I just think that it, it, like we've got to fix the situation so it doesn't happen again. And obviously, like I said, it's common practice. It's not just the Patriots, although it looks like it's the Patriots, and they always seem to get caught with their hand in the cookie jar. I think it's, it's a very interesting thing. But I also don't think it really affected the outcome of the game so much. Yes, it is still cheating. That's not okay. But, you know, it is what it is. Until you can stop everybody, you know, what are you going to do about it? I guess that's my feeling. What do you think of this whole thing, Pete? Uh, I think for some reason the Patriots just keep getting caught doing this. Maybe they're just bad cheaters. 
I don't know. You know, <laughs> maybe, maybe they're bad cheaters. I think it's that, uh, you know, I said this the other day. We're really positive here at Be Terrific. We want to create positive and inspiring content. And I think that, you know, a lot of people look for negativity. And when somebody's a perennial winner and you've got to respect, I don't like the Patriots as a team because I'm a Giants fan. And I like the New York teams. I like the Jets. And there are other teams I root for. I don't love the Patriots. What I do is respect the Patriots, what they've been able to do, what they've done. But I think a lot of times when you have a perennial winner, we look for reasons to knock those people down. We'd love to watch people rise up and then watch them fall. And so I think that's why we, you know, there are people out there who dig and dig and dig and go after teams like the Patriots again if they weren't doing anything wrong there'd be nothing to talk about so they kind of bring it on themselves but I think that this specifically is much ado about nothing especially when we find out that this is common practice in the NFL yeah I mean stop uh stop cheating yes um I agree I agree that has to happen too uh I do think uh that I I uh, I do think that you know videotaping practices and walkthroughs is, is a lot more of cheating than doctoring the game balls, especially because this isn't baseball where you're doctoring pitches uh, and potentially changing pitches. Um, you know, it's it's not going to have that much of an impact, especially in the game that was played. Um, Pete, Digital Phil loves you in the dark, and and uh, by the way, which is cool. I think we'll keep you in the dark, and and you, I mean, you said you like it there, and and it makes it easier for you to do your job. And by the way, uh, Ben says he had the the. Jordan 12s. I don't know what those look like. I might have to look that up, um, by the way, as well. And I want to say that tomorrow we've got a great guest. I'm really excited. Our, our show's over today. I mean, there's so much to get to and so much I wanted to talk about. But tomorrow we have a great guest. Um, this is really an inspiring story. Tina Katz is going to walk in here. She was hit by a subway just over a year ago and lost both of her legs. And she is going to walk in here and tell her story of overcoming all these challenges and she's going to update you on her story you see her story in the commercial breaks you've heard it before you see it on our site she is actually peter's sister and she's a great young girl a wonderful woman a good friend she's 31 i mean she was 31 she's got to be 32 now right i went to her birthday party she's 32 now uh <clears throat> no 32 in uh, july 32 in july so she was 31 in july so she has all her faculties all her functions and but she lost her legs very very crippling uh, and she's going to come in here and tell her story and, and really inspire you guys because she's going to walk in with her prosthetics. And a lot of you viewers helped her get those prosthetics and raise the money. So we're excited about that. That's tomorrow, and uh, you know we're excited for that. So don't forget to tune in tomorrow and check out Tina's progress and her inspirational story, and we will see you uh, tomorrow. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Michael Artis for Peter Poon, Adam Holtz, everybody who works so tirelessly at Be Terrific that does an amazing job. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to download our app, app.beterrific.com. Be terrific.